Hello everyone. I just wanted to record some uh, tips for you based on the chapter one system setup. Um, I do acknowledge that starting with system setup is a pretty boring way to start a class on editing, which I assume you took because you want to make cool new things and not because you want to, you know, have a minor in uh, computer science. But Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the world of editing today requires a lot of computer knowledge, and um, not understanding your preferences will make um, will undoubtedly create some issues for for you in the future. So it's it's dull, but unfortunately, it's really necessary that we start with these. So first of all, uh, one of the first things they talk about in the text is the show trimming. Show detailed trimming feedback. So if we go here into preferences, <clears throat> this is the preferences window, multiple panes that you can adjust things on. So good to remember that one. Because uh, if you have any trouble with the editor and maybe you're looking online for solutions at some point, it's good to know where you can find the preferences and especially the preferences for each one of these categories. But at editing here, we have show detailed trimming feedback. He recommends selecting that. And I would recommend that too. Let me show you what, why, or what that looks like. So here we have an edit between two clips in our timeline here. And what happens is as I trim this, is I basically change the length of one or both of the two clips. In this case, I'm just changing the length of this first clip. You'll see that two windows pop up here in this middle monitor. And the window on the left is showing me the first clip where it's now going to end in the window on the right is showing me where the right clip is coming in and as you can see I'm just modifying this uh, the tail of this first clip so the right clip wasn't moving so that's what detailed trimming feedback uh, is about and it is important because it allows you to see where your cut is going to happen in terms of where the two shots are and that's that's very important in editing, um, especially when we're doing some really detailed stuff, we want to make sure that we have nice clean edits um, in our videos. That's one of the signs of a professional editor. So turning that on means that you can visually see those things and it just saves a little time. Certainly if you had it turned off, you could always go back and just play the clip and see where the edit happens. But the, the other thing that's very important in editing is speed. Time is always a factor, and why do something that takes longer if there's a shorter way to do it? So we're always looking for ways to cut even seconds or so off of our editing so that we can finish our projects faster. So that's what that is about, and we'll talk more about trimming later on in the class. And then the other uh, setting here was position playhead after edit operation. <laughs> which uh, has got to just seem like a lot of mumbo jumbo to you if you're not familiar with editing. But basically what that means is when I, when I drop a clip in, what, what do I, where do I want this playhead, which happens to be right here, but I can click around here and move it. Where do I want that to go? And the, the reason we have that, that preference is because when I drop a clip in, if, if I have it that turned on so that this playhead goes right to the end of the clip that I dropped in, then it's ready to drop in the next one. As if, you know, if I'm doing a whole bunch of edits at once, dropping in a lot of footage, and I don't have to go down in the timeline and make sure that it's in the right place. So that speeds up your ability to take things, uh, clips into the timeline more quickly, make sure that they're going to be dropped in the right place. If that was turned off, you know, you might accidentally be dropping footage somewhere in the middle of your timeline. So trying to clarify a little bit here of some of these settings since I think without any kind of background knowledge on um, what these things are about, um, it, it might seem like complete nonsense about what exactly we're adjusting here. So that's kind of the reason behind um, those two uh, preferences. Another one he talks about is background render. If we go back into preferences, and um, that one is, where is that in? There it is, under playback. So background render, as they talk about in the text, is um, when the computer will start rendering your uh, video and images 
um, for you when you basically have stopped working. And here you can say, you know, when I've stopped working for a third of a second, I want you to start rendering things. And so, first of all, I mean, rendering is a big concept that we kind of will get into a little bit later, but basically the idea here is that it takes the computer a while to process some of the things that you tell it to do. So let's say you're, you're creating some incredible animation and, and you've got color changing effects in your video and you've got things flying across the screen. Well, unfortunately, today, someday in the future, this may not be an issue, but right now it takes the computer some time to actually generate that video for you of all these complex things that you've asked it to do. When it doesn't take any time, we call those real-time effects, and those are effects you can drop in. doesn't take the computer any time to render. It can do it um, on the fly. It is still rendering things. It's just doing it incredibly fast, so you don't have to wait for it. But there are still things you have to wait for. And so the question is, do you want the computer to start working on that stuff when you, you know, get up to get a cup of coffee? Um, or do you want it to just do it when you tell it to? And he suggests... That he likes to turn that off and you know I definitely I mean it's a preference for a reason some people want it on some people want it off um, what what you need to know is that then when it is rendering things it is making new things and those things have to go someplace and so that's taking up space on your hard drive and also maybe you're not 100% sure you want to make this effect the way it is maybe you're just kind of roughing things in um, and that sort of stuff, and you don't want it to be rendering things. So, you know, I, I think it's fine to uh, turn that off. Maybe as beginners, I, it's kind of kind of tough to, um, to know if you should turn that off or turn it on because um, it is good to know about rendering and how to render and, and render in an effective way. So um, anyway, that's, that's what that's about. I hope that just sheds a little bit more light on it. You're welcome to follow the, the text and turn that off. Um, but be aware that it's there. And if you find that you're spending a lot of time sitting around waiting for things to render, then it might be effective for you to turn that on and let it crank away um, in the moments where you're off doing something else. And, and uh, it could be a more effective use of, of your computer's time so your computer's working even though you're not there at it. And then also on um, playback, they have this create optimized media for multicam clips. <laughs> Another kind of complex thing. So what does it mean creating optimized media? What is optimized media and what are multicam clam, multi clips? A multicam clip is um, multiple camera angles of the same event is typically what we talk about. Uh, you, could, you don't necessarily have to work it that way. But what we're talking about here is maybe you shot um, something thrilling like a lecture and you had three different cameras for this lecture. It was a really important lecture. And now you want to cut all those three cameras together into one video. So you have your shot of the lecturer in a wide shot, maybe an audience shot. And in Final Cut, uh, it makes it simple, as do all editors. Um, I don't know about simple, but they, they make it faster to be able to do that kind of work. And so you can load those different angles in and you can easily switch between them to make your your edit but the problem with that is now instead of one video playing in your timeline at any one time you might have three or four and that is now really taxing your computer's system to be able to play three different videos all at the same time um, that is particularly tough for it so when you create optimized media that's Final Cut's way of making video basically is what we're talking about here, that is going to be optimal for that type of work. So unfortunately, we're bringing this up, um, even though multicam work, and it's, it's fairly common, but I, I wouldn't expect you to be necessary, that be to be necessarily one of the first things that you're doing. So um, it's sort of, again, like we're, we're having to get ahead of ourselves on this stuff. Um, talk talk about preferences on things that you haven't worked with at all yet, and who knows, you may never work with multicam clips. But that's the basic idea: is just making life for the computer a little bit easier if you're going to tax it with these multiple camera shots all at once. And then AV output—that's another one. 
that you don't necessarily have to worry about. If you're getting fancy and you've got another output, um, you know, a professional would, would have their video going out to a professional monitor so they can really see the proper uh, color and contrast and everything. But um, most of us, including me, don't have that, that kind of uh, monitor right now. So you can kind of ignore that. All right, sorry, I lost my window there. Um, so also under uh, settings, we can go, or preferences, we can go into import. The other thing they talk about is copy to library storage location or leave in place. Again, <laughs> boy, if you have zero editing experience, this is this has got to be maddening. I really feel feel for you right now, and that's why I'm trying to do this these videos to, to give you a little bit of background, maybe make it a little clearer what's going on. So one of the biggest issues in video editing today is how you handle all the incredible amounts of data that you're messing with. And for most people, they don't have to deal with this too much. If you're working in an Excel document or a Word document or something of that nature, you're working with such a tiny amount of data that you don't really have to worry about where it's going and, and how you're handling it. Now, if you've got a, a huge... Um, you know, picture collection that you're trying to sort out. Maybe you're, you've started to get a sense of the issues of, of data management a little bit with that, trying to get all your pictures all in one place and get it your whatever picture software you're using to um, organize it effectively. Um, uh, so here in video, we just this is just a massive, ongoing, constant issue and um, requires both a, a really solid understanding of how to handle it, and then also a tremendous amount of organization to handle it well. So um, this is a major got you already here. So when you are bringing in video into Final Cut X to edit it, it has to go somewhere. It either has to stay on the drive that you, you have it on originally, or you can copy it to the library storage location that you've established here in, in Final Cut, which we'll talk about later. So what, why these differences and, and what's the big deal? Well, um, so typical uh, work process, like right now I'm working on a documentary, I copy all the footage from my SD card onto an external drive. And it's going to be, I mean, easily probably a terabyte worth of footage. Okay, so this is, this is <laughs> a lot of stuff to sort through, and it's a lot of data that's going to be moving around. So... I need to think about, do I want to leave it on that drive and, and therefore just bypass the whole process of copying media over to someplace else? Or do I want to copy it onto the library storage location, which could be another drive that's hooked up to the computer? I guess it could be the, the computer itself, although that gets risky with having, uh, you could easily fill up the hard drive on your computer that way. So... Um, it kind of depends on, on your situation and, it, uh, and, and the type of video editing you're doing. So, for example, if, if I just had an SD card with some footage on it that I wanted to edit real quick, I would not want to leave that in place because that SD card is a bad storage device. It's something that I want to clear off so I can reuse, and it's also typically not that fast. And it's um, uh, also something, you know, Another reason could get lost. So in that case, I would say I want to copy to library storage location because if I'm popping in that SD card, any clips that I choose, I want it to bring over. If I've already got the, all the clips on an external hard drive, I'm happy with that drive. It's a good, large, fast drive. Then I might just say leave in place. I hope that clarifies a little bit. We'll be talking more about data management later on. But... Um, that's some details on those two. So when you're bringing footage into Final Cut, do you want Final Cut to move it to wherever you told it the library was, or do you want it to leave it where it is? And there's there's a, a lot of going on in those two, but that's uh, one of the ideas, uh, one of the things to consider. And then we have this create um, optimized media, create proxy media, and what is transcoding? <laughs> So, uh, you know, well, trans means like changing, right? And coding means coding, you know. I'm not going to get into the 
the like Greek or anything like that, but you know, let's break down the word a little bit. And this is so this is basically changing the coding. So you're you've got a clip that you shot on some camera and Final Cut is gonna convert it into the format that, that it likes or maybe that you've you've told it to uh, for editing in Final Cut. So do you want it to create optimized media for Final Cut when it does that? <clears throat> Excuse me. And do you also want it to create proxy media? Because let's say these are some pretty big video clips. Maybe you've decided that you want to get into 4K. Oh, good luck. Um, that would be a great candidate for proxy media because 4K files are huge, um, much, much bigger than HD, which is already uh, can be very taxing on a computer. So to create proxy media, and a proxy is, if you don't recall, is sort of a, a stand-in for something else. So this would be video that's smaller, that's going to play easier, so you can effectively hit play and it will play in the computer and you can do effective editing without sitting around hitting play and watching the, the pinwheel of death and waiting for it to finally um, play. So it kind of depends on, on the insanity of the video that you're trying to edit. Also, the power of your computer. If, if your computer is really struggling with editing, then you might want to turn on Create Proxy Media. However, you, nothing comes for free here, and that's going to require more hard drive space to create that those smaller files. So as the text suggests, um, I, they suggest not turning on Proxy Media, but I believe they do have you selecting um, uh, Optimize Media. I don't know, I'm just looking at the book right now. Um, so I, I think they have that turned off. That, again, is up to you. Um, and I just want to give you some more information about, about what these different options are. All right, sorry, each time I pause to just double check the text, I lose my preferences window. So he also talks about um, keywords. Don't worry about that too much. Um, right now, you can just follow what he says on that in the text. And then uh, destinations, which is, um, you know, a bit of a stretch for <laughs> video editing to come up with a term for what, what this all means. But this, essentially this mean, it means what, what is the destination of, of the video that, that you're making? Where do you want it to go? Do you want it to go to Vimeo? You're going to make a Blu-ray disc? You're going to email it to somebody, Facebook? And so they have a bunch of presets already because there are essentially infinite settings for taking the video that you have created in Final Cut <clears throat> and outputting it for the world or for whatever purposes you have. So the settings for that video for DVD are, are very different than what they're going to be for YouTube, which is different than what it's going to be for Blu-ray. And so basically, they're trying to save you the trouble of experimenting. This, this could all be gone, and in, in editors for a long time, there was there were not a lot of, you, you didn't have these nice little presets. You either, um, you know, it was trial and error, or maybe you'd, you'd uh, Google what, what the best settings were for YouTube or something. But now the uh, software designers are building this stuff in for you, so you don't have to guess. I want to output this to YouTube, you click YouTube, and you're good to go. And the nice thing about this is that you can add destinations. So, for example, let's say you're making a video for a client and they have a very specific purpose for it. You can um, customize the output settings of your video so it, it meets those purposes. Maybe they want to project it or they want it super small for something. Who knows? And you, then you can save that so that the next time you make a video for that client, you don't have to remember all the different settings for that. Um, or maybe in your own um, use your your outputting maybe you don't like the YouTube default settings or maybe you're outputting for something else and you want to get it exactly a certain way um, you can the, a great thing to do is to adjust the settings for that output exactly the way you want it and then save it so that's what this is about it's about saving time some of these you know uh, will even upload for you which is a, another um, advantage so that you don't have to output this video and then go to Facebook and then find it and upload it that kind of thing you can actually log in and upload directly and uh, even add you know comments and and some details on it so that's a, a time saver too because remember editing is all about doing this as quickly as you can so those are some of my notes on the first chapter if you have any additional questions about um, chapter one, things that you don't understand or maybe things aren't working for you the way that 
that you want to, please let me know. But uh, other than that, it is it is a little tricky, but stick with me. Trust me, this stuff will make will make sense eventually. I'm going to do my best to simplify things that seem complex. And you know, when you see see weird terms, don't worry about it. There's there's a lot of strange words in in video, but they they will make sense after a while. And really, um, it's it's not about all the the weird terms and everything. We can talk you through that. It's it's about your creative vision, um, and it's about the the footage that you're editing is going to have a much bigger impact on the quality of your project than your ability to understand optimized media and proxy media, in my opinion. All right. Thanks. Shoot me any questions if you got them.